I absolutely am just overjoyed to be here this morning. Um, I love preaching on Thursday nights at Freeway, downtown Sanford, but there's something special about just being here on the Lord's Day um, on a Sunday morning to be able to preach the Word of God. Um, and don't be swayed by by this suit jacket and these slacks. I'm just a sinner saved by grace that found some good deals at some factory outlet stores. Um, my wife and I, like I said, are overjoyed that we get to be here with you guys this morning and share what the Lord's doing in our lives and in our ministry. Um, but before I jump into the preaching of God's Word, I want to thank you guys, everybody here, for your faithfulness to the Lord, um, just for being willing to partner with us and because if it wasn't for churches like you guys, if it wasn't for the strength of the Lord and God leading you guys to, to help us, then our ministry wouldn't be possible. And so thank you so much for all that you guys do for us um, with your prayers, with the finances, with your support, um, just everything you guys do for us. Thank you so much for that. My wife and I are right now in a season of continual growth. We've been uncomfortable since we've been to Florida. There hasn't been a day gone by that... We have got to sit back and just be comfortable. So um, it's if it was not, like I said, for the strength of the Lord and you guys' um, support, we wouldn't be here. For those of you that still don't know who I am, my name's Trey Odom. I'm the director of Freeway Sanford. I want to give you a, just a quick little, like, what is Freeway? So we, of course, have a Thursday night outreach every Thursday downtown Sanford, and we minister to the hard to reach, the people that most would say in society that have are too far gone for help. Those are the people that we're ministering to. But there's people there that aren't like that. There are people there that are transformed, like my wife said, that, that have an awesome testimony of God's grace. But Freeway is so much more than just a Thursday night service. We also have a one-year-long discipleship program where we can, um, we can have men and women um, separate houses, of course, come in and we can, they live there for a year. They surrender a year of their lives to the Lord and then to the program and they follow our rules and it's a spiritual boot camp. It's not an easy program. I went through it. Brett is here with us this morning. Brett graduated in, um, in the, uh, from the program in Missouri and he flew down here. He's, he's given back to his ministry and he's committed another year of his life to be our house leader here in Sanford to raise more men up and to disciple them and and just relieve a little bit of burden for myself. So, um, yeah, we have a one year long residential program and um, we get people that come in and out of jails and uh, people that are coming out of rehabs, people that are homeless, people that are strung out on drugs, and we get to show them like, hey, there's hope outside of a needle in your arm. There's hope outside of a bottom of a bottle, and so um, that's that's kind of what freeway is. Um, so long story short, I was in jail three years ago, um, three and a half years ago, facing 70 years in prison. That's seven zero. Um, I didn't know the Lord, and I was content to either die in prison or with a needle hanging out of my arm, homeless on the street. That's just how I thought I would die, and I was okay with that because it's all I ever knew. It took God, like my wife said, with her bringing me to a very low place in my life um, in order to break me and for me to cry out to him. But this morning, I want to talk to you about another man who was brought to a, a very low place in his life and how that man reacted apart from the way that I reacted. And as I preach, um, I'll incorporate my testimony, but as my, intes- as my testimony could be encouraging to some, I believe that it's only the Word of God that can save and transform. So I would like to you now to turn your attention to the Word of God in and, and Psalm 34, um, and I'll read verses 1 through 8. So Psalm 34, verses 1 through 8. And if you are willing and able, could you please stand to honor God's word as I read it? So Psalm 34, verses 1 through 8, and the word of God says, I will bless the Lord at all times. <coughs> Excuse me. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look at him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. 
The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Let's pray. Father, we come before you tonight or this morning. And um, I can never get over the fact that I get to do this, Lord, that I get to come here and preach your truth and to share testimonies and just to let people know that there's hope. Um, and hopefully to get others outside of, outside of their comfortability zone, Lord, to know that, that, that we can leave this building and take the church with us and we can minister to those who are on the street and let them know that there's, there's hope and that they're not too far gone, Lord. And so I just pray that you, um, help me to speak truth today. If there's something in my notes that you don't want me to say, Lord, give me discernment to not say it. If there's something that you do want me to say, Lord, help me to say that. But Lord, just convict people of their sins today. Um, by the preaching of your word, do what only you can do, um, Lord, and we'll give you all the glory. It's in your son Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. You can be seated. So I've titled this sermon, Bad Times, Good God. And to understand why, I want to kind of give you guys the context behind Psalm 34. And so the context behind this can be found in First Samuel chapter 22 and the beginning couple verses of First Samuel chapter or 1 Samuel chapter 21 and the beginning of 1 Samuel chapter 22. But David was on the run from Saul, who was the king over Israel. And David was sent running, and he had no time to plan. He had no money, no weapons, no plans, no food. But he had to leave town in a hurry. And so he enters the sanctuary hungry and scared, and he runs into Ahimelech, the priest, and asks for food and a weapon. He gets some holy bread that's really not for eating, um, but he gives it to him anyways, and the only weapon he had was the sword of Goliath, who David had killed in battle recent, uh, previously. So David leaves the town of Nob, and he ends up in Gath, and you can find all that in First Samuel chapter 21. And Gath is the hometown of Goliath. And so now this is where things start to get interesting, because David begins to act like a madman. He starts drooling from the mouth and acting wild um, to escape the king of Achish, or Abimelech, whichever you prefer. And he starts acting like this wild animal, and the king lets him go. And David ends up in the cave of Adullam, which you can find in 1 Samuel chapter 22. And he's now on the run from authorities. He has all the outcasts gathered to him, it says. And this is where he writes Psalm 34. And I want you to just go to that place in time and imagine David sitting in this cave thinking about this close call that he just had with the king. I want you to just really think about that moment. And David was in the hometown of Goliath, with Goliath's sword strapped to his side, and and he was trapped inside the gates, and he found a way to escape. And so his family family surrounds him, and then it hits him. This was nothing short of a miracle. And so he pulls out his pen, and he writes, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And so do I have any Bible nerds in here? I know that I love it whenever I find cool things in the Bible, whenever I find these gold little nuggets in the Bible. And what I typically do is I, I'll run to my wife and I'll be like, hey, look what I found. And my wife, she's very loving and very patient with me. And she typically turns to me and she's like, I already knew that. <laughs> but anyways, for my Bible nerds in here, I, was, I thought this was super cool when I found this. But did you know that... That Psalm 34 is actually actually an acrostic poem, psalm. And what that means is that each verse in the psalm begins with a successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And so if it was like the, the English alphabet, the, the first verse would start with A, the second one B, the third one C. And so David wrote this psalm in this order for a reason. But why would he do that? Why would David do that? Because David wanted to remember this time in his life that God saved him. David wanted to remember this low place that God had rescued him from. This is a psalm of praise, a psalm of deliverance. David stops in the middle of his crazy situation and writes a psalm of praise. I remember growing up in in my unsaved and worldview thinking I had a lot to complain about. And so what did I do? I complained a lot. When I was nine years old, I was suspended from school for getting into a fight, and I went home, and um, I told my parents that I was suspended from school for three days, so my dad beat me, and um, my dad beat me so bad that I had welts from the back of my legs all the way up to my shoulder blades, and I grew up 
my whole life from the time I was that he started whooping us like that um, till I was nine years old, thinking that this was normal. Until I went to school three days later after being not suspended anymore, and the teachers found out that I was spanked, and they took me to the nurse's office, and they stripped me out and seen that I had all these whelps up and down my back, and they told me, this is not normal. And so they took me to foster care, and for 20 years, I complained about this. I complained, and I complained, and I complained for 20 years. I complained about this thing, and I use it as a reason to rebel against all authority in my life because of what my mom and dad did to me, and what it cost me was 11 felonies in the end. But David... David's on the run, and he's lost everything. He has nobody, and he's scared. And instead of complaining, in verse 2, he says, My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. And so I want to ask you this morning, I like asking questions. How many of you have ever been to a low place in your life? A place where you thought that life was just over? Uh, a time in your life where, you, where it just got real and scary? Maybe it was a financial crisis, maybe a miscarriage, maybe you lost your mom or your dad or your job and a time in your life where you just didn't think tomorrow was possible. John Calvin said the term soul in verse 2 signifies not the vital spirit, but the seat of the affections as if David said, I shall always have ground for boasting with my whole heart in God alone so that I shall never suffer to fall into the forgetfulness of of so great a deliverance. David was praising God in the middle of this hectic situation. He says, I will bless the Lord. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Oh, magnify the Lord. Some of you in this room, I believe, need to remember where God has brought you from. My pastor back home says that some people, they, they get so comfortable in, in their Christianity that they, they end up with spiritual amnesia and they forget where they've come from. You act, like we're, you, you act like you forgot what God has brought you from. And so when is the last time that you've stopped and you've just given God praise? When's the last time that you've testified of the goodness of God and where he's brought you from? If it wasn't for the low places in my life, then I wouldn't be standing here today. By the grace of God, I'm able to stand here today and testify because of my low places in life. And so I beg you tonight, or this morning, brothers and sisters, don't forget where God has brought you from. Verse 3 says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. David is inviting us to praise God with him. Because of what the Lord has brought you out of, you have reason to boast this morning. Praise God. Testify him. Tell people when you leave here what the Lord has done for you. Don't forget where God has brought you from. This was a personal testimony of David. He was writing this so everybody could know what God has done for him. He says in verse 4, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. After I was taken into state custody whenever I was 9 years old, I turned into a very depressed little kid. My parents ended up getting custody of me about a year later and we moved to some little hillbilly town called Licking, Missouri and uh, where they literally probably counted the chickens and the ghosts with the population. And so, after living there for about a year, my parents met some people that taught them how to cook meth. By the time I was 15, I was addicted to alcohol, weed, and meth. By the time I was 16, I was shooting meth. By the time I was 18, I had caught multiple felonies, and I was facing a life sentence for a drive-by shooting where a couple people got shot. By the time I was 20, and I had already done a year in prison, and by the time I was 30, I had caught 11 felonies and done eight years in prison and been in and out of rehabs, jails, prisons, any kind of institution that they had in Missouri, I was there. I was affiliated with a gang, and I went to prison this last time, and I was supposed to do eight months, but I ended up doing three years because I didn't want to go home because prison was my home then. I had had this brotherhood in there. I clicked up with this gang. And so that was my home. I didn't want to go home. Um, So I ended up doing three years when I was supposed to do eight months. They had to put me in solitary confinement for the last six months because I couldn't stay out of trouble in prison. And so what that meant is that they put me in the cell all by myself, and I got out every three days for a five-minute cold shower. And so I um, I finally got released from prison, but being in that cell for so long had messed my head up. And so when I got out, I didn't know how to act. The only thing I knew was to get high. And so what did I do? I got high. I was out of prison for six hours and already had a needle in my arm. 
Um, fast forward three years, I got into a fight with the police over some meth. He thought he should have it. I thought I should have it. We were both very opinionated. Long story short, he won. I was released from jail. They bonded, I got bonded out. Um, shortly after being bonded out of jail, I broke into somebody's house, stole some guns, some laptops. They caught me the next day on that, and I went back to jail. They ended up giving me probation for both charges with a 17-year backup, which means that if I messed up, I went back to prison for 17 years. Um, so I get out of jail on probation. I move in with my sister, and this is all around the time that COVID happened. <coughs> Excuse me. This is all around the time that COVID happened, and I caught five more felonies within a two- or three-year span. Um, but it was COVID, so they had to book and release. Book and release, if you didn't have a violent charge or you didn't have a warrant out for your arrest, they couldn't hold you in the jail because of COVID. And so COVID ended up dying off, and all my warrants started popping up, and I ended up getting arrested and thrown back in jail. And uh, they were offering me 30 to 50 years on top of the 17 years that I was already on probation for. So basically, they wanted to give me 70 years in prison and just do away with me for good. But my probation officer, she was a godly lady, and she loved the Lord. And she said, Trey, you've been to prison almost 10 years of your life. And she said, it's not helping you. She said, I really want to find something that can help you this time. And so she found um, an application of Freeway Ministries, and she said, I think this is the right program for you. So I filled out the application, I was accepted into the program, and three days later, I had warrants in three different counties, I was sitting on over a million dollars in bonds, and three days later, all my bonds were dropped, and all three counties released me to the program by the grace of God. Um, And this was probably my lowest moment in my life. I had nothing to my name but the clothes on my back, no friends to help me, no family to call, facing the rest of my life in prison. Um... But I was accepted into the program. Uh, A month later, we were at a Bible study in this little old church in a basement. And they were talking about the assurance of salvation. And I was like, what does that mean? Well, they And they basically told me, well, it means that you know that you know you know you can be saved. That you can walk out of here knowing that you're saved and nothing can take that from you. I was like, no way. Not somebody like me. I'm way too far gone. They said, no, you're actually a poster child for Christianity. Like, God can do a lot of good things with bad people. If you look in the Bible, that's evident. Um, And so I really wasn't ready to give it up yet, but they kept pouring into me, pouring into me, pouring into me. And they said, they took me to Romans chapter 8, verse 38 through 39. And they said, this is what Paul says in the Bible. He says, for I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death. And just in case he missed anything, Paul says, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. They said, you can give your life to the Lord tonight and know that nothing can take that from you. And I went home, and as David says in verse 4 of Psalm 34, I sought the Lord And he answered me, and he delivered me from all my fears. And verse 6 says, this poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. And I was like, man, that's me. I was this poor man, and I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and he answered me. And listen, church, I cried out to the Lord on a bunk bed in a recovery program, and he heard me, and he saved me. My life has not been the same since. Do you remember the day that the Lord saved you? Do you remember the day that the Lord redeemed you? Is there a burning desire in your heart to praise God every single day? If the answer is no to that, then I have to ask you why. At Freeway, we typically speak to a crowd that has a burning desire to self-satisfy, to do whatever they want to do. They love toxic relationships. They love to numb themselves with drugs and alcohol. But every once in a while, you'll get, a man, you'll get this man or this woman that comes in And they surrender their lives to the Lord. And they're on fire for Jesus. They know how to take discipline and correction. When you tell them no, their their chest doesn't poke out. But why? What's changed in these people? Why are they different? Because they've tasted the goodness of the Lord. We get men fresh out of jail a lot of times. For instance, my wife and I, we had the privilege to take this guy from Freeway Orlando um, to the courthouse the other day, and we got to minister to him on the way, and he got to go in there and take care of some stuff. And when he came outside, I said, where do you want to go eat? Anywhere you want to go eat, we'll take you. He said, you know, you'll probably laugh at me for this, but I just want to go to McDonald's. He said, I just want a greasy cheeseburger and some greasy french fries. I said, all right. So we took him to McDonald's. 
We ordered him a double Big Mac and fries and a large ice or a large Coke with no ice. I didn't even know a double Big Mac was a thing. I hadn't been to McDonald's in a long time. But we got there, and we ordered, and I got some fries, and um, the fries in the bag were so hot that I couldn't even touch them. They were fresh out of the grease. And I'm sitting there trying to nibble on these fries, and this guy is over there scarfing them down. I mean, I don't even think he breathed the whole time he was trying to eat this Big Mac and these fries. He was just scarfing them down. And before I was halfway done with my small fry, he had these large fries and this double Big Mac scarfed down. And I was like, dang, this dude hadn't had a cheeseburger in a long time. So you say, where are you heading with this, Trey? Well, look what David says in verse 8. He says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. When you take refuge in God, you can taste and see that he is good. And I don't know everyone in here. I don't know where you come from or what your background is. But I do know that I wish that everyone in this room would experience what I've experienced. I'm not talking about some charismatic feeling that overwhelms you and you get out of control with your life. No, I'm talking about the feeling of loving the Lord and tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. Like that man who who devoured that cheeseburger. He didn't care if those fries were burning in his mouth or not, and I'm sure they were. He wasn't afraid of the outcome, but how many of you can honestly say to yourself that you don't, you don't care what the outcome of following Christ is, that you're willing to do it at whatever cost necessary? I want you to know what it means to live for the Lord. I want you to, I want you to know what it means to live for the Lord. I want you to fall in love with reading your Bible I want you to drink from the living water of Christ. And in closing, I'd like you to turn your attention to verses 19 and 22 where David says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps his bones and not one of them is broken. And this verse actually is speaking prophetically of Jesus. While David could look at his past and realize that the Lord has saved him and not none of his bones were broken, we look to Jesus. And what it says in the Gospel of John, in John 19.36, it says, For these things took place that the Scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And unfortunately, the world and the culture we live in has painted this false picture of Jesus. They've painted this picture of a needy Jesus and a sissy Jesus that needs us for some reason. That's all love but no wrath. A Jesus that loves you but does not punish you. But the Bible teaches something so much different than that. The Bible teaches that we've actually all sinned against a holy and righteous God. We serve a great God, the God of this universe, who gets angry and pours out his wrath. Who demonstrated his wrath when he poured it out on his son. And it amazes me, it it blows my mind that this God would crush And kill his own son. But he would save us. This spotless, sinless, perfect son of God. Suffered his father's wrath so that we could be saved. He was nailed to a cross. And as David foretells, his bones were not broken. But the other side of this is that there is condemnation for those who do not receive this message. Look at verse 21. It says, affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. And I don't say this to scare you into making a decision. No, 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 no. That's not why I say this. I say this because the Bible says it. There's a price to pay for sin, as Paul says, the wages of sin is death. And he also says that we've all sinned. And so you can make one of two decisions here this morning. You can walk out of here knowing the truth, knowing the truth that that I've just given you, And rejecting it and being destined for hell. Or you can walk out of here this morning knowing the truth and accepting the truth. And being a redeemed servant of the Lord. The Lord redeemed my life. And I'm not, I'm not here to, to, to preach prosperity because my bank account would definitely argue against that. But I just want to let you know what the Lord has done for me since I've given my life to the Lord. When I gave my life to the Lord, God placed a burden on my heart to call my parents and tell them, hey, I forgive you for what you did to me. And so it was one of the most uncomfortable conversations I've ever had to have in my entire life. 
And so I picked up the phone one night when I was in the freeway program back in Missouri, and I called my parents, and my mom picked up. She's like, she said, hello. And I was like, hey, is dad around? And she said, yeah. And just to give you a little bit of context, my parents and I, we couldn't sit in the same room without telling each other we hated each other for longer than five minutes. We, we couldn't stand each other. We didn't like the presence of each other. But God placed it on my heart to call them one night and tell them, hey, I forgive you. And so I called him. She picked up, and I said, hey, is dad around? She said, yeah, your dad's around. And I said, well, can you put it on speakerphone? I want to talk to both of you. She said, yeah. And so she put it on speakerphone, and uh, I said, I want, to, I want you both to know that I forgive you. I, want, I forgive you for what happened, and I just want to call you for the next 30 days, for the next month, and I just want to pray with you guys, and I want to share each other's burdens, and I want to know what's going on in your life, and I want to tell you what's going on in my life, and I just want to, I want to get over this hump in our life. And so that's what we did. We called each other for the next 30 days, and we prayed with each other every day, and we shared burdens that we had with each other, and we just talked about life and moving forward. And like David says in verse 3 of Psalm 34, he says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I graduated from the program. I met my beautiful wife one evening while I was preaching. I like to tell everybody that she was staring at me the whole time I was preaching. She says everybody was staring at me because I was preaching. Um, (laughs) Either way, I met her that night. We were married four months later. Um, where my dad was my best man. My mom coordinated my wedding. Um, As my favorite pastor, Arthur Goncalves, once said, worship expects company. It's contagious. When, When you fall in love with the Lord, you want others to know about it. And so it expects company. And so we gather with the Lord, and we tell others about what he's done in our lives. So then in hopes that they can once and one time be able to share what the Lord's doing in their life. But listen, this morning, I don't want you to walk out of here saying, wow, what a great testimony, or wow, what a great preacher. I doubt you say that anyways. But I want you to walk out of here saying, wow, what a great God who uses us in our low places, who, who knows that there's nobody too far gone that can be saved. Maybe you're low places today. Maybe you're listening to the sound of my voice right now, and you're in a low place. I would just encourage you to cry out to God this morning. Magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Father, we come before you this morning. I thank you so much for the opportunity to come here and share our testimonies and just preach to you or to preach to this congregation um, about low places in our life and letting, letting them know that there's still people out there that haven't heard the truth, that don't know that there's hope outside of being homeless. And, Lord, as I look around, as I drive down these streets, and whether it's in Longwood or Lake Mary or Sanford or Orlando, we can see that the homeless population is rising, Lord. This world's not getting better, Lord. So we beg your return, Lord. We ask you to, to return. And until then, Lord, help us to preach your truth to this lost and dying world, Lord. And we will give you all the glory. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.